Hello, I'm B.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. Uh, I'm here today with longtime friend, neighbor, author, child, child advocate, and pediatrician Lance Chilton, uh, who used to write columns for Century Magazine and is now a columnist uh, for the Albuquerque Journal on children's health. In my judgment, he's 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 the kind of doctor who you want to ask hard questions of because he is completely believable and uh, and has a wonderful presence. And I've known him for years, so I'm, I want to talk about a very sort of complicated issue with him not today about measles and um, mumps and and rubella and that vaccine. We want to get into a little bit of the of the issues around big pharma and uh, revolving door physicians uh, are working for them. But mostly we want to talk right now about, about vaccination and measles and maybe also a little bit about um, uh, the worries that many people have about vaccinations. Uh, I know many people who I respect who have these worries, so I want us to try and deal with those if we can in a straightforward way. It's wonderful to have you here with us, and uh, I can't wait to get into this. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate your having me on your your program, and it's very nice to see you anyway. Well, full disclosure here, I um, I'm one of those guys who gets immunized for everything I can I can think of. I get the flu shot all the time. My kids got immunized, and my, and my grandchildren and everything else. But we hear a lot about um, about measles in New Mexico, and we hear that the the numbers are kind of small around us and. But the way it's portrayed in the media is that there's some impending, looming epidemic uh, about to happen here. Is that, is that the case in, in your judgment? I have to give the full disclosure also that I've been immunized against everything that I can be, and my children and grandchildren have been also. Um, but to answer your question about a measles epidemic here in New Mexico, I don't think it's very likely. I mean, after all, we've, we have uh, measles around us to some extent. There's one case in Colorado and one in Texas and seven in Arizona and a bunch in California. But that's pretty much nothing compared to the way it used to be before. But more particularly, if, if measles were introduced into New Mexico, there was one case last year from who knows what source, um, the, the fact that more than 99% of um, New Mexico school children are completely immunized against measles and 89% of um, two to three-year-olds are immunized against measles reduces the likelihood of measles spreading in, in New Mexico to practically nothing. Now there are places in New Mexico where there are clumps of people who, um, who band together more or less to resist immunizations. And, and so in those places, small epidemics could occur, small outbreaks could occur. Why would it be that uh, uh, that we're so well immunized and other places might not be? I'd like to think that New Mexicans are more concerned about what science tells us about vaccines and about vaccine-preventable diseases. But given the level of education that um, we seem to hear about in the newspapers in New Mexico, that's probably not the whole reason. It may be that that the anti-vaccine um, uh, sentiment that has has uh, affected many parts of the country has not gotten to New Mexico. So actually, um, if you look at entering kindergartners in New Mexico, only somewhat less than 1% have so-called exemptions so that they don't get all needed vaccines. So let's talk a little bit about measles themselves. Uh, what was it like before before vaccinations appeared in, in the United States, and when did that happen? And uh, why don't people who were born before 1957 have to get immunized? Well, the easy answer to the last part of your question is that all of us got measles back in those days. Uh -huh. You got measles, I got measles, and... Um, 
and we, most of it, most of us got over it. Um, so there were something like 3.9 million cases of measles per year in the United States. And since the birth cohort is about 4 million, that means that virtually everybody got it at some point. So before vaccinations were a part of our world, what was it like to be a kid with those diseases? And did everybody catch everything in those days? That is a broad question. Um, the Prior to the onset of vaccines, about 1% of the average group of children would die from vaccine-preventable diseases, or diseases that are now preventable by vaccines. 1%. 1%. So most of that actually was diphtheria, which is a disease you don't hear anything about because it's gone thanks to vaccines. Gone for the moment, anyway. Yeah. Um, measles only, only kills about two for every thousand people who come down with it. So. Um, I can't do the math quickly in my head, but yeah, if you had 4 million cases per year and 2 per, um, two per thousand of that would be, what, about 400 deaths yeah. per year or something like that? So what does measles do to somebody? Well, I'm old enough, so I don't remember <laughs> it in, in, in my own personal case, but um, the cases that I've seen in my medical career the children get very sick. They have a very high fever. Um, they have a rash that extends from the head down towards their feet and then gradually recedes. Um, they have a cough. They have runny eyes. They, are, they have difficulty with light. Um, and they're, they're really quite sick. Um, a certain proportion of them will develop measles pneumonia or measles encephalitis. And measles encephalitis can cause death. It's about, that's the main cause of the two per thousand who die um, and can cause mental retardation and seizure disorders and other problems. So why, why is measles so virulent? I mean, apparent, we read all the time that you, know, you walk into a room and you know, somebody has it, you walk out, you probably are carrying carrying the germs with you in your clothing and you go into another room and spread. What's the nature of that virus? The measles virus is remarkably infectious. Um, and so it doesn't take very many particles for me to cough on you to make you have measles. Um, we talk about something called the reproductive number or R number of given infectious diseases. So, for example, for influenza, during the great influenza outbreak of 1918, 1919, the R number was about three. So, for every case of influenza, three contacts would get it. That was a very high number for influenza. The number for measles is 18 to 20. So, it is six or seven times as, as contagious um, as the disease that, that throttled the world in 1918-1919. So, when one reads in the newspaper about measles, I use newspaper advisedly, one gets the feeling that the whole country is suddenly overcome with measles, that, there, that it's all over the place, that there's an epidemic, there's a terrible danger, because, there, because there's been some some you know some cases in Disneyland. Now that's clearly, if if your numbers are, or what I'm hearing is is not the case. Uh, so, is this media frenzy about this disease really up to speed with the reality of what's going on? There have been, uh, as of a couple days ago, 141 cases of measles in the country since the beginning of January. Um, that's a large number for measles in this century. In this but, century. But if you look at the beginning of the 20th century, when there were 4 million cases, yeah. it's chicken feed. What I'd love you to do, if you could, is talk a little bit about the, the MMR vaccine, the measles, mumps, rubella max, uh, no vaccine. Why would people be worried, I mean, in your judgment, uh, but about that vaccine? The measles, mumps, rubella vaccine has been around for a while, and um, it was it was a particular 
in my view, corrupt researcher in the United Kingdom who in the late 1980s published a study which purported to show that children who had received the MMR vaccine had uh, evidence of that vaccine virus being in the uh, areas around their intestines. And his theory was that, um, and this in children with autism, um, and the theory was that, that somehow the virus had caused the intestine to become more permeable to toxic agents that then caused the brain to, to change and become autistic. This, um, this was a gentleman by the name of Andrew Wakefield, um, used to be Dr. Wakefield, but his uh, medical license was revoked by the United Kingdom a few years ago when it was uh, determined that he had fabricated this information along with a number of uh, uh, apparently unwilling uh, uh, conspirators, co-conspirators, um, and, um, and had been under... Uh, um, in the pay of barristers in the in the United Kingdom who were suing the vaccine manufacturer on behalf of these um, children supposedly made autistic by the vaccine. Since that time, there's been a lot of discussion um, by such uh, scientists as Jenny McCarthy um, about uh, the the fact that her child, she thinks, was was made autistic by the vaccine, and um, and unfortunately, um, this has permeated the the culture to some extent, so that there are groups of people who avoid the vaccine because of this concern that it might be causing autism. So, uh, vaccines come in solutions, and and. Um uh, you inject a solution into your arm. Now, there's been there's been lots of talk about mercury in them. There's been talk of aluminum in them, which people are worried about uh, brain damage with that. There's been talk of, of formaldehyde. Is that is that a real issue? If it was, has it been addressed? Uh, I keep on hearing that newer vaccines are free of that kind of stuff, but I don't have any any historical background to say that they are were there in the first place. So could you sort of maybe address that a little bit? Mercury um, was present in vaccines uh, in the United States until about 20 years ago um, when um, almost all of it was removed. Hmm. The only place where there is any mercury product at all is in multiple dose vials of influenza vaccine, um, which um, are still available, still used. Um, that, um, that mercury product is called thimerosal, and it is an ethyl mercury uh, product. Um, we're getting a little bit into right. chemical um, yeah. stuff that I don't, um, don't know that I can explain very well. Um, when we all looked at those pictures of the terribly crippled children in Minimata Bay, Japan, yes. um, I can't remember who took those pictures, but they were they were chilling, chilling indeed. Um, that was that was methyl mercury, and that was mercury that had leached into the Minimata Bay from chemical plants in Japan and caused terrible damage to children. Um, but ethyl mercury has never been shown to cause any damage. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, because of concern about it, uh, the uh, the vaccine supply in the United States was very quickly um, stripped of the the um, ethyl mercury product thimerosal, and so now virtually none of that is of, is given to our children. Uh, just to round up the question, what about aluminum and, and formaldehyde? Are they? Once studies had um, had pretty much debunked the the thimerosal story, then. Uh, people who are opposed to vaccines or worried about vaccines moved on to other components like formaldehyde and aluminum. Uh, but the amount of aluminum 
that one gets from vaccines is far smaller than that which one gets from eating tuna from a, an aluminum-containing can. Um, the formaldehyde that we eat is probably, uh, I'm sorry, the formaldehyde that we get from vaccines is probably considerable less than, considerably less than what we inhale from the formaldehyde that is used to, uh, to make our clothes look pretty when we buy them off the shelf. So to try to put, put this question of vaccines in a broader context, and then I don't want to leave it and go back to the illness, but um, uh, we read in the New York Times uh, in 2009 that one of the chief, um, well, the chief operating officer, officer of the CDC popped over and is running Merck. Um, we know of these revolving doors between science and industry. We know that there's a, a kind of a glorification, if you will, of science, which of course is, by definition, falsifiable. Or at least that's what it's supposed to be. So this 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 sort of climate of which affects up all of us, me included, quite strongly, of um, sort of collusion and corruption, if you will, and perhaps. Uh, perhaps fine-tuning and forgetting certain things in order to make a profit for these guys you're working for now. This sort of adds a climate of, of a patina, if you will, to the whole question, in my judgment. And I know the people who are, who are concerned about this stuff also have these same worries. Uh, and even though they're being vilified, which I'm not saying you're doing at all, but, 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 this is, but this is the general context. So I'd love you to talk about that just a little bit. I think I'm putting you on the spot. I don't mean to. But... Uh, but it is a broad reality. Well, in the spirit of full disclosure, which you you began with, um, and I also have gotten all the vaccines that I could get, and my children and grandchildren have as well. Um, I should also say that for four years I served on the CDC's uh, advisory committee on immunization practices, that um, really sets vaccine policy for the United States. I was very proud to do that. And, you know, I think I feel that um, that we vilify, to use your term, we vilify um, government bureaucrats. But the people I worked with at CDC um, when, when I was on that committee um, were really wonderful public servants who used science in ways that I thought was very important and who um, spent a great deal of time with concern about vaccine safety, for example, um, to the benefit of the American public. Um, that said, you know, there is, a, uh, there is movement between Congress and, and lobbyists. There is movement between um, the Defense Department and the military industrial complex, or the, um, and there is movement between CDC and the far more remunerative um, pharmaceutical companies. Um, I don't. I did not see evidence of that um, permeating the uh, the ACIP meetings, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice meetings. I felt that there was respect for everyone in the room, whether it be someone who was opposed to vaccines, parents who, who had suffered or had their children had suffered from vaccine-preventable diseases, the pharmaceutical companies, to be sure, physicians, pharmacists. There was the, the room was full of people who were respected for the views they brought to the process. So I know there's... Two bills in, in, in the legislature at the moment which deal which which deal with vaccines. Could you explain those just a little bit? The bill I've been working on, which is called Senate Bill 121, would preserve for New Mexico children the ability to get vaccines pretty much wherever um, they are in contact with um, medical people um, without a charge to them. So it's, it's sort of like free vaccine, although it's not free, of course, to, the, to those who pay for it. Um, th that um, process, which is called universal purchase, um, is in danger, um, 
primarily because some of the insurance companies have not been paying into that fund for the the children who are insured by them. Um, the other bill, um, which I haven't seen yet, um, was said in the Albuquerque Journal yesterday to be uh, about to be presented by um, uh, Representative Armstrong from the North Valley in Albuquerque um, would um, make it impossible for parents to say that they have a philosophical objection to vaccines and to have that stand up with the children then being able to go to school. So, so do you th uh, do you think these two bills will pass? Uh, I know you're uh, you're not a, a prognosticator, but uh, and um, what do you think the implication of them would be? Well, the implication of passage of the first bill, the one that I'm working on, would be to maintain more or less the status quo where where children can get vaccines where they need them. So I guess the, the question should be turned around to say what would happen if it were not passed. Yeah. And what would happen if it were not passed is that some physicians would decide not to buy vaccines and then hope that they could be reimbursed for them later. And so ch there would be missed opportunities to vaccinate children. Um, if that happened, and for example, the rate of um, vaccination against measles were to fall, say below 95 percent, then then the situation might arise that we could have a sustained epidemic of measles in this in this state. So I think I think it's important to pass that so that we can keep a good thing going that yes. that um, the children could be immunized. The second one, um, which I have some mixed feelings about, um, would affect that 0.7% of children who are currently uh, exempt from vaccines when they get to kindergarten. So um, it's a small number. Um, I think uh, there would be a lot of pushback on it if it, um, if it passes, but it would decrease the reservoir of children who, um, who are not immune to these diseases. And it is only 0.7% overall of New Mexico, but they tend to be concentrated in certain parts of the state so that um, certain areas are more susceptible to measles outbreaks than the state as a whole. I suppose I'd object to, to a governmental restriction on philosophical views myself, but that's, that's beside the point. But, uh, but I'd like to kind of get a, um, a feel for as a person who gets all these shots, we know that that the image is is that you get you get vaccinated and you're safe. But we know that in certain cases, uh, take take for instance the flu shot, that's not at all true because oftentimes it doesn't isn't designed to get the strain that's that's happening. And then uh, so so I I think what I'm always interested in is trying to sort of debulk the myths. Uh, it's important to do this in my judgment. But it's not a silver bullet. Uh, you still have to wash your hands, you still have to be careful, you still have to, you know, you still have to do all all the normal things that a normal person would do, or that a healthy person would do, that aren't subject to media hype and craziness, uh, which I think now is, you know, becoming, you know, the way of our world. Anyway, could you talk about the the, the nature of vaccines, the vaccines themselves, and how how immune are we really? Well, you're certainly right that this has been a bad year for influenza vaccine, for yeah, example. Yeah. So uh, the CDC has uh, estimated that the current vaccine has been only 23% effective against the H3N2 strain of uh, influenza A that has been predominant this year. Um, that's very unfortunate. Um, yes. yes. And, and in the previous year, the the nasal flu vaccine, which um, is given to children primarily, um, was not effective against the H1N1 strain that was present that year. Yeah. So it's not perfect. Um, in the average year, the flu vaccine is about 65% effective. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's not 
perfect by any means. It, um, but it does reduce the likelihood of any single person getting influenza, and it reduces that reproductive number that we talked about before, um, the uh, number of people who become infected from a given single case to below the, the number that are needed to maintain an epidemic. So it's very important in that way. And after all, influenza kills 22,000 people in this country per year on average. So, um, so anything we can do to reduce that epidemic is very important. Fortunately, measles vaccine is about 99% effective. Um, it's not 100%. Yeah. None of them are 100%. Um, but, really but it's pretty, pretty darn close. Let's talk about adults just for a minute. Seeing as how I'm an adult, <laughs> I'm scared. Yeah. So there's there's no reason to get a booster shot um, for measles or anything like that if you're an old if you're an old person, particularly if you can't remember if you had measles or not. Or if you're one of those people who was born before 1957 and therefore not immunized, um, and you're not sure that you had measles, um, there are three approaches you could take. Um, one is that you could assume that um, you probably were exposed to measles and maybe just had a mild case and um, you were not one of those uh, relatively few people who escaped it somehow. Two is you could um, get a measles, mumps, rubella vaccine right now mm -hmm. and you can do that. Yeah. You could go to most pharmacies and get it. Mm -hmm. Or three, you could ask your doctor to um, send a blood sample to a laboratory to determine if you have antibodies to measles. We have unhappily run out of time. This has been really enlightening, and I'm so glad that you that you could deal with these complications in the way that you have. I'm really grateful. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. I, I really agree with the... Um, the public health people who say that vaccines were the number one public health measure of the 20th century. That's, that's pretty important. They're still very important.